just pray that we have a good service this evening and uh, to that end, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day you've uh, given us and uh, Lord, uh, more than anything, the opportunity to come together once again to worship you and uh, Father also uh, through your preacher um, hear something from you uh, through your word and we just ask now Father you would bless this time and we'd ask these things through your son's precious name. Yeah. Welcome to church tonight. We'll start off by singing Lily of the Valley. If you can all stand with me, we'll sing all three verses tonight of the Lily of the Valley. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the first of ten thousands to my soul. The Lily of the Valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and be fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, and trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousands to my soul. He all my griefs is taken, and all my sorrows born. In temptation he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn from my heart, and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me so, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest sun and thousands to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here, while I live by faith and do his present will. Oh, all far about me, I'm nothing now to fear. With his manna, he my hungry soul shall fill. Then sweeping up to glory, I'll see his blessed face, wherever delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousands to my soul. You may be seated. The next one we're going to sing tonight is What a Friend We Have in Jesus. We'll sing all three verses of this one as well. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear What a privilege to carry Everything to God in prayer Oh, what peace we often forfeit Oh, what needless pain we bear All oh, because we do not carry Everything to God in prayer trials and temptations is there trouble anywhere we should never be discouraged take it to the Lord in prayer can we find a friend so faithful who with all our sorrows share Jesus knows our every To the Lord in prayer. Are we weak and heavy laden? Come, but with the Lord of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in prayer. To thy friends despise, forsake thee. Take it to the Lord in Take and shield thee, thou will find a solace there. Well, welcome once again and good evening to everyone. So it's time for our memory verse. Yep, there it is, Ephesians 5 15 to 17. 
I'll say it, you say it, and let's go through it twice. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 to 17. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And again, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to that. If you could all stand with you one more time, we're going to sing Does Jesus Care? We'll sing the first and the last verses of this song. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 41. Genesis chapter 41. We're going to be looking at a couple of verses um, from there. And then we're going to be talking about a topic that I hope to try to illustrate in a couple of ways for you uh, this evening. Um, now, we're in our series that we're calling Blind Spots, and a lot of times there are different things that take place in our lives that sometimes we can't see them. Uh, they're in that blind spot, and uh, we need the Word of God or we need a Christian brother or sister uh, to come alongside of us and to help us see them. And so the first one we talked about was anger. And then, um, unbeknownst to him, uh, Dan preached sermon number two, because literally, in my list, the second one was pride. And I thought, well, I could preach the sermon that I had prepared for pride, or, nah, Dan already preached it, so I'll just go on to the third one, right? And uh, that's okay, that's, that's fine, uh, that works. And so, um, if, you, if you do a search uh, on our YouTube channel for this series... Uh, you'll find Dan's sermon is in the series. And uh, so there you go. Um, and anyways, and this one will be number three in it. And we're going to be talking about a topic that when I give you the topic and you look at the passage, you're probably going to go, huh? Now, when I talked about anger and we went to King Saul, the connection was easy, correct? But if you know this part of the book of Genesis... This part of the book of Genesis is about Joseph's life, right? 
Now, how many of you ever recall reading that Joseph was discouraged? Few of you, maybe. Not directly. If you, if you think about it in the way, where did it ever say Joseph was discouraged? It didn't. It doesn't. However, the passage that we're going to read this evening, uh, I hope to show you some things from it, and then we'll look at uh, this idea of discouragement. So Genesis chapter 41, verses 50 to verse 52. It says, And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, the uh, priest of On, bare unto him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God, he saith, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Now, I would propose to you this evening that in the name of his sons, we see that Joseph faced some discouragement. You say, what do you mean? Well, the first son literally means God hath made me forget all my toil. Uh, that word toil, another word for, for toil is, is work or hardship or things of that nature. And so Joseph, would we agree, had some hardship in life. He did. And we'll talk through that in a moment. And the second son, uh, he called him uh, God, hath made, uh, God has called me to be fruitful, what? In the land of my affliction. In other words, Joseph said, and we'll, we'll get to the, the way he words the, the, sons of his, the names of his son, is how we can deal with discouragement. Uh, but Joseph basically said, he named his two boys, God's made me to forget my toil, my, my hardship, my affliction, uh, my distresses, my my hard times, and then in that, he's made me fruitful even in the land where I'm afflicted. And would we agree that every turn it seemed Joseph went, Joseph was afflicted. He had different difficulties that came into his life. First it was ten brothers, and then it was a, was a master, and then it was his, you know, a, a wife that um, spread falsehoods about him, and then he was put into prison, and then he was forgotten right? In prison, and then and on and on we could go. Discouragement. Now, discouragement can play a very important part in our lives. It can stop us dead in our tracks. About 75 years ago, I read a story of a woman. Her name was Florence Chadwick, and she was the first lady to swim the English Channel both ways. In other words, she swam across the English Channel turned around and swam it back. I don't know about you, uh, that's, that's a bit of swimming, right? Um, won't find me doing that, but she did that. And then in about 1952, she decided to swim from Catalina Island to the shores of California in the U.S., and that was a distance of about 34.4 kilometers. The day, if you know anything about that area, that's up in the area of of, you know, where it's, it's very foggy and, and very things of that nature. And it just so happened that the day she chose to swim turned out to be shock horror, foggy, and chilly. Now, if you've ever been in, in that part of California when it's foggy, I mean, like, foggy to the point where you can't see the hand in front of your face sometimes. It, it's really bad. And so she set out and she began to swim. And she swam, and she swam, and she could hardly see the boat because whenever you do one of these types of swims, they always have a boat that comes alongside of you in case you, you know, something happens, you don't drown, all right? And so that, that boat was there, and it was going along uh, beside of her, and sometimes you'd barely even see that boat. Yet she swam steadily for 15 hours. And then she began to beg to be taken out of the water. Her mother, who happened to be in the boat alongside of her, told her that she was close. You can make it. 
Physically and emotionally, though, she was done. She was completely discouraged. She stopped swimming. And if you know anything about trying to make that type of swim, the minute you stop, it's not a good thing. So they pulled her out of the water and into the boat. And it wasn't until she was on board the boat that she discovered she was less than one kilometer from the shoreline. So in other words, she had swum over 34 and a half kilometers and was that close to the end. At a news conference the next day, they, they asked her, why'd you stop? You had the ability, you've swum further, you know, you swum just as far before. Here's what she said. All I could see was the fog. I think if I could have seen the shore, I would have made it. But because I couldn't see it, even though it was right there, she gave into the fog, she gave into the chill. You know what? I believe she could have made it. A lot of people there that day believed she could have made it. But she did not give up because she wasn't strong enough to finish. She gave up because she became discouraged. She couldn't see the shore, so she lost her faith and discouragement blinded her. In today's passage of scripture that we read this evening, we read of the man named Joseph, and he had two boys, and, and the names he gave them seemed to indicate that he got discouraged at some point in his life. One of his boys, as we said, he named Manasseh because God hath made him to forget all his toil and all his father's house. Now, that would be a difficult thing to forget all, about all your family and all those, those types of things. And, and then the other one, Ephraim, he said that he called him that God had made me uh, fruitful in, my, in the land of my affliction. His hardships and his afflictions. What's that about? Well, if you, if you know the story, um, Joseph had ten half-siblings. Right? That's all we call them. Like they were his brothers, but they were they were half siblings. Because if you remember, there was uh, Leah and Rachel, and you know all that problem uh, that went on there. And here's the other problem that took place in that family: is Dad liked Joseph more than the other ten, and we know that because Scripture tells us that because he gave him a coat of many colors. Yes. And we know that that didn't sit well with the brothers because when that came up, you, you read the story. But here, to make the problem even worse, not only did it appear that dad liked Joseph more than the other ten, but guess who else did? God. You say, what do you mean? Remember, God gave Joseph two dreams. And in those dreams... All of his siblings bow down to him. And in one of those dreams, his parents and his siblings bow down to him. So God began to reveal things to Joseph. Now, uh, how was this, this hardship? How was this toil? How was this affliction? Well, uh, one day, they got Joseph alone. They threw him in a pit. They beat him up. They threw him in a pit. They were going to kill him. Until along came slave traders. And one brother said, you know what? It's best that we not kill our own brother. You know, it's, it's always a good thing that you don't kill someone. You know? But anyways, why it had nothing to do with relation, I don't know. But it's best that we So let's, you know, let's do the next best thing. Let's sell him and get rid of him. So that's what they did. And he went down and he was bought at an auction. And there he served his master well to the point where... Um, everything in his master's house was under Joseph's control, except, obviously, his wife, Potiphar's wife. Then one day, Mrs. Potiphar uh, began to notice Joseph and began to make requests of Joseph. And Joseph said, you know what? I, I'm not going to do that. I, I am not going to sin against my God. And, and off he went, and uh, he was thrown into prison. And then for about 17 years... He was a captive in Egypt. 
He was a captive as a slave, then he was a captive as a prisoner. And all of those times, he had no hope of ever seeing his home or his family ever again. And that, I believe, is toil. That's difficulty. That, that if you want to use a word we would use, that's hardship, is it not? To lose everything you knew. That's affliction. And that's why he named his sons those names. Now, oddly enough, Joseph never seemed to have pity parties, did he? We never, we never get recorded in Scripture where Joseph had a bit of a pity party for himself, do we? I, I don't find it. He, you know what he seemed to do? Well, this is where God's put me. This is where I'm going to serve. This is where I'm going to be a blessing. This is where God's put me. This is where I'm going to serve. This is where I'm going to be a blessing. And on and on and on and on he went. By the way, almost a third of the book of Genesis is focused on Joseph's life. But you never really read about him being discouraged, except when we read about how he named his two sons. It would seem that Joseph had every reason to be discouraged. Wouldn't you say so? If your brothers beat you up, would you be discouraged? If your brothers you know, threw you in a pit, think you'd be discouraged? If they sold you as a slave, that, that's discouraging. If you're falsely accused and thrown into prison, discouraging. Well, he didn't deserve to be treated like that. So how could Joseph avoid the blind spot of discouragement? The answer, I believe, is found within the text that we read. In the very names of his sons. Because remember, he said, for God hath made me to forget all my toil. And God hath made me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. So let's notice what Joseph did. The very first thing in the most difficult times and how we can avoid the blind spot of discouragement is this. Joseph focused on God. We talked about it a little bit this morning in growth groups. When you focus on your circumstances and what you're going through, it's a bit of a tunnel vision, is it not? It's a bit of a looking at one object and, and one thing. But he focused on God. He said, God made me forget. He said, God made me fruitful. Joseph's walk with God was so connected that his mindset all throughout his captivity was on God. Now, in Genesis chapter 39, look at verses 2 and verse 3. Let's go back a couple of of chapters, if you still have your Bible open there. Genesis chapter 39, verses 2 and 3. I know, you're probably still wondering, what is the water, the containers, and stuff for? We haven't got there yet. We'll, we'll get there. You're probably wondering, what's the PowerPoint for? We haven't got there yet either. Just come along for the ride with me, okay? Uh, Genesis chapter 39, verses 2 and verse 3, it says, And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Not only was God with Joseph, but everyone around Joseph saw that God was with Joseph. Do we notice in that verse who it was that saw? It, it was his master. It was Potiphar. It was the guy who bought him from the slave market. Then you go on and look at verse uh, Genesis chapter 39, verses 20 and 21. And Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were bound, and he was there in prison. But Joseph was, but, God, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. The next thing happens, what do we see again? God was with him. Go down to verse 23. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him and that which he did the Lord made to prosper. Do we see a recurring theme in Joseph's life? 
that God was with him. Four times in this chapter, we're told that the Lord was with him. Now, going back to school days, if someone's trying to teach you something and they repeat themselves four times, doesn't that generally mean pay attention? Doesn't that generally mean you might want to remember this? You could be tested on this someday, right? But for God and one chapter to say this four times. Now, uh, that phrase does show up in other stories of the Bible, okay? So let's, let's be honest. It shows up once in the stories about Samuel. It shows up once in the stories about David. It shows up another time in the stories of Hezekiah and a, and a couple of others. But Genesis 39 is the only chapter where it shows up four times. So why does it show up so often in Joseph's story? I believe it shows up so often because Joseph knew God was with him. Joseph's focus was on God, not on his circumstances. Now, everybody gets discouraged once in a while, correct? Some people get discouraged a lot more than others. But there's a couple of things I'd like to consider about discouragement this evening. All right? First thing, let's take a look at the Word. Hopefully, there we go. Uh, hopefully you can see that. It says discouraged. If you can't see it, I apologize. I didn't realize the lighting was going to be what it was. Uh, but is the word discouraged? Do you notice now, I know you're going to look at me and you're going to say, I'm at church, it's Sunday night, I'm not doing a grammatical analysis of a word, and I'm not looking at, you know, prefixes and suffixes and all that, but just humor me, okay? Do you see a word within the word discourage? Courage, right? And there's three little letters at the beginning of it. Discourage, right? Okay. Now, if you think, think that word, you see that word? Encourage. You notice the same word within it? Courage. But it's two letters difference. And so as you begin to compare discourage and courage, you find they both have courage within them. So what's the difference? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because that little dis means literally to remove from. In other words, what does that mean? It means that something has happened to remove your courage from you. Let's just look at these two things. They have, both have water in them, correct? For one thing, let's make pretend that that water is courage. Okay, just use your mind. Are you ready? And so we're going to say that this, the water inside of this, let's say this bucket's you. Yeah, it's easy to imagine me as that bucket, okay? Uh, that bucket's you. That water inside you is your courage. Something has discouraged you. You've gone through some toil. You've gone through some hardship. Uh, the, so Joseph, he was beaten up by his brothers. Courage was removed from him. He was thrown into a pit. A little bit more gone, Right? He was uh, sold into slavery. Well, there goes some more. He was falsely accused and put in prison. You only have so much courage, right? And if everything keeps taking it away, discourage keeps taking it away, what soon happens? You're discouraged. All your courage is gone. Now, if you look at this other word, encourage. You know what the E-N means? It means to put into. So remember we said these both are courage. So when you encourage someone, you know what you're doing? You're putting their courage back. You're pouring into them. You're putting more courage in there. What are you doing? You're refueling what the discouraged took out. Right? What was refueling the courage 
that the discouragement was taking out of Joseph. He was focused on God. He always walked with God. Time and time and time again in Scripture, what do we hear recorded? The Lord was with him. The Lord was with him. Those around him, whether it was Potiphar, looked at him and said, wow, I'm going to put everything in Joseph's care. Why? Because God is with him. He has got put into prison. Now, think about this. If you are a prisoner, if you're the keeper of the prison and this prisoner gets put into your care, would you give the keys to the kingdom to a prisoner? No. But that's what happened. Why? Because the prison warden saw what? That God was with him. And so all throughout Joseph's life, we, we see this thing. Hey, and we take a look at the discouragement. We, we have what, a lack of courage can come when we face system, uh, when we face situations we can't control. Could Joseph control any of the situations that took place in his life? No. He couldn't control what his brothers did to him. He couldn't control where he came out of the pit. He couldn't control where he was sold into slavery. He couldn't control the false accusations that were made against him. He couldn't control that he was forgotten in prison. And those things can be very discouraging. He found himself in a foreign land with no chance of getting home. He was a slave trapped in slavery. He couldn't change the fact that he was not his own person. When he was a prisoner, he was locked behind doors and he would never be able to open. You can understand if he got discouraged. And I know none of us this evening are in physical slavery. None of us are held captive in a foreign land. But you know what? There may be circumstances within our lives that are beyond our control that can be simply removing the courage from us. One little bit at a time. And discouragement, when courage is taken out, what happens? Discouragement fills in and it can be something that we don't even see happening in our lives. It's situations like that that can rob you of your courage and your hope, and they can blind you with discouragement. So, what do we do about it? How do we gain our courage back? Well, uh, the only way to get back the courage you've lost is to find courage, to be encouraged, to have it, what? Poured back in. So how do we do that? Well, the same place Joseph did, from God, from our walk with God, from his word. Now look with, with me there in, in that passage of scripture as we as we're there in, in Genesis chapter 41. What put it back into Joseph's life? Well, when he named his sons, he said this, and the name of the uh, firstborn, Manasseh. Why? For God, he said, hath made me to forget all my toil and all my father's house. Where did he get the courage from? From God. Something in Joseph's walk with God, something as he walked humbly with his God, began to pour that courage he had lost back into his life, little bit by little bit. He said, God made me forget. And then with, with, um, with Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. You know what he said? God made me fruitful, right? God made me forget. God made me fruitful. Why? Because God was with him through all of his affliction. Have you ever heard the phrase, God will never leave you nor forsake you? Well, we often, when we say that, we, we quote the book of Hebrews, but really, Hebrews was actually quoting the book of Deuteronomy. You know, the book of Hebrews quotes a lot of the Old Testament, it quotes a lot of Leviticus, and in this passage of Scripture, it's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 31. Look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 31. In verse 8, 
And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. That's um, as, as, as uh, Moses was about to die, he was speaking to Israel. He was speaking to Joshua. By the way, it's repeated in a very similar way. Just go a little bit forward in your Bible to Joshua chapter 1 and look at verse 9. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage, be not afraid, neither be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. You say, how can you explain that God's with you and he never leaves you and never forsakes you? I can't. Can you? I, I don't know how it works, but I do know this. It's true. Wherever you are, whatever you're going through in life, God said he would never leave you nor forsake you. He said he would go with you. He would walk beside you. And it's a repetitive theme all throughout the Bible. In fact, it shows up, go to the book of Philippians in the New Testament. Uh, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, we'll look at verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Uh, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. It passes all understanding. Why? Because God's with you. It doesn't make sense. It shouldn't work, but it does. Hey, how could Joseph not get discouraged in all that he was going through? How could that blind spot not blind him? God was with him. You say, how? I don't know, but he was. Matter of fact, God was with him so much that everyone around him, when they looked at his life, they said, wow, the Lord's with him. The Lord makes him prosper. I, I'll, give, I'll give him more to do because, you know, if God's blessing him, then if I give him more to do, then who's, what's that going to mean? God's going to bless me, right? Someone once said, if you're ever going to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might... Your strength will be born in a storm, not in the peaceful times of life. Where was Joseph's strength born in? In the trials and the afflictions? And all those things that God made him forget. The thing to realize is that you and I are weak. We're human. We have faults. We have frailties. We have a sinful nature. But guess what? God isn't. And God, and God told the Apostle Paul, hey, my grace is sufficient for you. Isn't it? Isn't he? Paul three times said, God, remove this thorn from me. And God said to him, no, 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 no. My grace will be sufficient for you. It's when we learn to trust that God will never leave us nor forsake us that God begins to go, and pour back into us that courage. Hey, all those times, I believe, that in Genesis it's recorded, but God was with him. You know what God was doing? God was pouring back into Joseph's life, saying, you know what, I'm here. I'm with you. I know it's hard. I know you don't deserve this. I know it's difficult. And I know you can't control anything that's going on around you. But I'm with you. And he began to pour back into his life. and began to pour back into his life. There is a story of a single missionary lady. I don't know if you ever read the... No, I've always tried to encourage you to read missionary biographies. 
And I was reading one one time about a lady by the name of Gladys Allward. And she was a missionary in China, and she uh, loved the Chinese people. But in World War II began, she was forced to flee uh, with the invading Japanese army. But she was torn by the belief that she couldn't leave the people she loved to suffer, especially the many orphans uh, that were under her care. And so, with one assistant to help her, she led more than 100 children over the mountains to try to get to freedom. And during that long and hard journey, she began to struggle with discouragement. She couldn't control the mountain situation. She couldn't control the weather. She couldn't control anything. Can you imagine taking 100 children hiking through mountains? I can't. She began to be discouraged. Uh, she thought there's no way they'd ever reach safety. The children would starve or die in some other way. And there's nothing she could do to stop it from happening. But it became so obvious to the children that she was losing hope and not sleeping. So one morning, a 14-year-old little girl in the group reminded her about their much-loved story of Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. The Israelites survived, so they would too, is what this 14-year-old girl uh, told this missionary. The missionary bitterly cried out, but I'm not Moses. And the little girl looked at her and says, of course you aren't, but God's still God. I don't know about you, but that'd be a bit convicting, wouldn't it? The rest of the story goes that at last they came to a river. And they made it over the mountain just to get to a river where they couldn't cross. And they were there for four days. And they were trapped there. And at one point, a young child asked, Why does God not open the waters of the Yellow River for us to cross as he did for the Israelites. For a moment, Gladys paused. She thought, I cannot open these waters. I have no power other than the faith, power of my own faith. So she looked at the children and said, Let, let's sing a hymn to God. And perhaps soon our prayers would be answered. And believe it or not, not far away from where they were, an army of Chinese soldiers heard the children singing praises to God. When the soldiers came to the children, where were they began to supply them with food. They gave them boats to cross the river. And every one of the hundred children made their way to safety. They couldn't control the circumstances. But you know what they learned? When God is with you, he can pour the courage back in. And we can overcome that blind spot that can creep into our lives of discouragement. So let me ask you this evening, What's removing the courage from your life? What's discouraging you? Are you resting or being encouraged and allowing God to pour, to encourage you or pour that courage back into your life? Can I tell you something? Just like when that little girl said, you know what, why, why can't you part their waters? And she said, but I'm not Moses. That, what that little girl said was 100% correct. But God is still God. And if God was with Joseph through all his affliction, and if God was with Joseph through all that went on in his life, and God was with him, can I tell you something? The same God that promised to be with Joseph, the same God that promised to be with Moses, the same God that promised to be with the Israelites, the same God that promised to be with, with, with Joshua, is the same God that promises to be with you 
to pour the courage back into us. If we just stop letting the blind spot of discourage blind us from the presence of God in our life. Wouldn't it be awful to go through something like that, that swimmer, where you were so close to, to making it and you gave up simply because you stopped looking for the fact that God was with you and you're too focused on the circumstance. And so rather than having the courage poured back into your life, you are having it removed from your life. What's the difference in the two? Courage is in both words. The difference is, is it going back in or is it coming back out? And that's simply decided on what are you looking at? Are you looking at the circumstances or are you trusting in the God that's with you? Father, we come before you. And Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity. We thank you for your word and the encouragement it is. Lord, we thank you for the life of Joseph. But Lord, most importantly, we, we're thankful for the God of Joseph. The God that was with Joseph is the same God who's promised to never leave us nor forsake us. Lord, I pray that you would allow, we would, you would help us to allow you to pour the courage, to encourage us and pour the courage back into our lives and not be blinded by the things and circumstances of life that would seek to remove that courage from us. And Lord, may we truly rest in the fact of knowing that you are with us and that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The last one we'll be singing tonight is Leading on the Everlasting Arms. We'll sing the all three verses of this song. What a fellowship, what a joy divine leading on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leading on the everlasting arms, leading, leading, safe and secure from all alarms, leading, leading, leading on the everlasting arms. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leading on the everlasting arms. Oh, how bright the path flows from day to day, leading on the everlasting arms. Leading, leading, safe and secure from all alarms. Leading, leading. Leading on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leading on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leading on the everlasting arms. Leading, leading, safe and secure from all arms. All right, once again, thank you for coming out this evening. If I can be a help to you um, in any way, please do let me know. Now, some things just to uh, know that are coming up. Um, on the 12th of November, Sunday morning, is our Vision Sunday. We'll be going over uh, some things for next year. On the 19th of November is the opportunity to uh, sign up and get involved in serving in some ministry here at the church. Uh, now, also on that Sunday morning, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be an unusual Sunday morning uh, because the title of the message will be Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Sunday School. And so the pianist will never leave. She'll just stay there. And the children will stay in the service rather than going to children's church that one day. Normally there's children's church in the morning, but that one day we'll all stay here. And uh, you'll help me sing through my message. We'll sing a song. And then we'll explain the biblical lesson from it, and we'll sing a song, and so we'll all do that together on that, that Sunday. On the 18th of November, it's a Saturday morning at 
uh, men and boys are going to be having a prayer breakfast that you're welcome to attend. Uh, we'll, we'll give you the location uh, in, a, in a few weeks, um, but we'll have that time. We'll have breakfast together. We'll spend some time in prayer. And, and then on December 3rd, Sunday evening, December 3rd, is a family service. And um, if you were here the last family service, we had an object lesson with a balloon. I won't bring a balloon back next time, I promise, but we'll have my jungle story uh, that we'll learn something from. And then on Sunday, December 17th, is the much anticipated, often looked forward to Christmas fellowship, right? And we'll give you some more details about the Christmas fellowship that is coming up. I believe that's everything that's uh, been going on in the next few weeks. Uh, if you came out yesterday morning and were able to help at whatever time uh, that you came out to go letterboxing, thank you so much for that. Uh, believe it or not, in just over about an hour's time, uh, those about 15 people who went out letterbox and were able to put a gospel invitation into 963 homes. And so that's, that's exciting, and that, that's an opportunity. And uh, if you want to grab some, some invitations, go ahead and grab them. You're welcome to letterbox wherever you live um, and invite people to church and all those types, and we're, we're, anytime you want, you want to go for a walk, uh, we're happy to do that. And then we uh, thank you for being a part of that yesterday. All right? Uh, let's go to Lord in a word of prayer, and then uh, we'll be dismissed. Uh, but if I can help you in any way, please do see me after service. Father, we thank you again for this evening. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you for uh, the promise that you're going to be that you'll be with us and will not leave us nor forsake us. Lord, I pray that you help us as Joseph uh, to be filled with courage, with that knowledge, with that fact. And Lord, may you help us not focus on the circumstances that we cannot control. But Lord, help us focus on the God that we walk with who can control the uncontrollable. And Lord, may you give us the courage we need to avoid this blind spot in our life and to uh, live in courage to be able to serve you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.